Hi, everyone. Hi. Hi. Hello. How's everyone doing? Pretty good. How about you? Yeah, I'm really glad it's uh, cool today. Kind of raining because my AC is busted. Oh no, this is a bad time of year for that. Really bad time of the year, but I was really overworking that thing. You know, I should have listened to Con Ed when they say don't, don't run your AC all the time. That's that's not that's not what you're supposed to project to the grad students here. You're supposed to have this like opulent life of luxury that. So that way Marina can say, gosh, only when I get my PhD, I'm going to be living like tree shank. Well, I mean, uh, just, just make sure the, the life of luxury includes two, two air cons, redundancy. <laughs> you will be fine. Yeah. Just going to give a few more minutes and see if anyone else joins. I'm um, just setting up the notes. Good day, folks. So I added uh, two items to the agenda. Um, I looked through a lot of the comments on the pull request. Um, I unfortunately didn't have enough time uh, this past week to add in the uh, uh, the deployment admin, the deployment user rule, as well as the diagrams, which we talked about last week. Um, I'll take a crack at adding that in this weekend, uh, but I think there is enough conversation in the comments, or there are two key items, I think, that are worth discussing. Um, the first one, I think, is on the having the multiple root keys, and the second one is just looking at key revocation uh, larger in general. Um, I think we can start off with uh, multiple root keys, uh, Trishank. I think uh, uh, you and Marina both went back and forth on that, and I think uh, um, uh, Miloslav also had some comments, and but he's not here today. But we we can kind of discuss some of those. So I think um, from my perspective, I kind of share some of uh, Miloslav's concerns uh, in that. Uh, even if we have multiple keys uh, as a requirement for the root key, uh, typically what we're seeing is that those keys are all being stored in a similar fashion. Um, so uh, a, a compromise of multiple keys is just as likely as a compromise of a single key. Um, so what we were kind of moving more towards was something similar to a two-factor authentication, if you will, uh, well there, where there is a separate route to kind of like share what your trusted keys are uh, which is what we're envisioning Notary v2 would look a little bit more like. Um, but I think this 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 one we can we we can kind of like look at the pros and cons of each approach and um, decide pretty quickly on sort of like you know what approach we want to move forward with. Oh yeah, I totally agree. I mean, so so I I think there's two separate issues here, right? That we should we should take some pain to try to uh, distinguish. One is that. I think it was wrong to lead with multiple root keys. That that's not that's a good idea to have multiple keys, uh, but I don't think that's what we're trying to emphasize here. What's more important is that even if you're one root key, that's fine. If that's what you want to do, you should have a way to rotate the keys. That's the really important point. Here. That's the more important point, I would say. Uh, Marina, do you have thoughts? Yeah, I think that before we go too much further, I think that um, I had a question actually about the what we're talking about when we talk about root keys. Um, because uh, going through the document, it seems like there's like a lot of different root keys in the system. 
And I think that um, if we can kind of clarify, you know, who, who needs to make these root keys and what they're doing with them, then I think it might be easier to figure out what kind of management is reasonable. Um, so if we could go through that really fast first, I think that would be helpful. Yeah, I think we can clarify some of that. So uh, essentially the way I was envisioning the root key as working is the same way that we have the root key currently working in Notary, uh, the first implementation, in which case it would essentially tie into being like an I like the, the root of like what what's this, used to establish someone's identity, right? So uh, each developer that's trying to identify themselves as a developer or each entity like, you know, could set up their own root key. Uh, and then all the timestamps, uh, if we decide to use snapshot keys, uh, like, you know, delegate keys, uh, these would all change from that single root key. So the root key would be analogous to what we're currently using in Notary, um, but this would essentially be the root of trust that uh, chains into like a single identity that you are saying that I trust this identity. Okay, that makes sense. But I think, because I think that that was part of um, my confusion actually was that, um, I kind of was envisioning a system where like there's a, a single root key that then delegates to these developers um, and other users of the system. And so I think that, um, you, you know, because there's less of them, I think that the more management is reasonable, but if there's going to be one for each developer, then yeah, I totally agree that um, the multiple offline keys will probably be um, harder in that case. So um, I do. Yeah, we want to make a distinction there between, I, I, I misspoke and I don't want to kind of have that great confusion as well. So uh, I use developers pretty loosely. So uh, I'm, I'm considering kind of like use cases where you have individual developers like pushing sort of like containers and that want to be identified versus sort of like maybe large enterprises that have multiple developers. Um, I would envision an enterprise having either a single root key uh, per sort of like organization or potentially sort of like multiple root keys per sort of like smaller teams that they want to have individual root keys for, right? Um, so taking sort of like, you know, uh, a, a large sort of like company, they may have like one sort of like root for their Windows business, one sort of root for their Linux sort of like containers. So I think what we want to tie the root to is sort of like an identity um, that someone else wants to verify, whether that's an individual developer, whether that's sort of like a, a legal entity, uh, I think we'd let sort of like the, uh, uh, the, uh, the signing admins decide how they want, how many routes they want to use and uh, what those routes would tie into. Okay, I think my concern there is um, like, would be like how you figure out um, which of these root keys to trust. Because if there's no like centralized um, root that you know clients start with that they can find these other keys from, I just don't know how they would figure out you know which of these developer roots to use. Sorry, there's a lot of background noise. Right, and I think this is where the uh, key sharing service, if you will, which is what I think uh, Notary can morph into, comes in um, is sort of like a a service that's telling you that could either be stood up by the individual organizations. It can be something that's a bit of a shared service as well. If we will have like trusted providers uh, where you can kind of go in and check what the root key for sort of an identity is. Um, this is kind of similar to sort of like uh, where um, companies are sort of like, you know, putting on their websites what their uh, public keys are. Um, and so I think that's, that's where we'd look for sort of like an out of band uh, key sharing service that isn't necessarily tied into how containers are signed and propagated. Uh, it would be a second service that's managing that, that, that key sharing mechanism. Yes, yeah, do you I'm see a concern go ahead. with, sorry, go ahead. Oh, thanks, thanks. I was just going to say, I'm kind of curious about the design of this, um, this external key service, because we know from experience that if you, if you don't, you don't want to tightly couple everything, of course, but when it comes to designing secure systems, if you don't carefully integrate them, uh, you might run into unexpected security issues, but, but we can discuss that separately. Yeah, I think that's one of the things um, uh, we definitely want to dive into once we get into the detailed design 
um, at a high level, what the sort of like the deployment administrator, if you will, they have two options, right? Um, right now, they can manually sort of like uh, write in the public keys that they trust. So whether this is like, hey, I have like an internal private repo set up, I know what keys I'm using there, or sort of like, you know, I trust these large companies. Here's the private keys that they published on their website. These are the keys I want to I want to I want to add into my repository. Um, that's one route. And then the other one is that if there is an automated service that can get that information for you, um, then that's where the key ma the key sharing service comes in that you're able to kind of like say, here are the key sharing services that I trust for these entities, uh, you know, automatically get the keys from there. Um, I think we would want to kind of dive into sort of like what the auth mechanism there looks like, um, what are sort of like potential threat models that we need to kind of address there. Um, there's always kind of like concerns around sort of like, you know, what happens if a key sharing service gets compromised, what are sort of like the remediation steps there. Those are things we need to address in sort of like the design and threat model. Um, but at a high level, I think what this addresses is that um, in the event of a key compromise, you're not necessarily kind of like at risk um, because the, you'd also need the key sharing service to be compromised and you'd also need the registry uh, to also have like your upload credentials to be compromised. So there's three different things I think that you need to compromise at this point uh, in addition to just a key compromise happening. So um, I, I'm wondering, do we need a centrally managed um, key ser uh, sharing service? And what I mean by that is, what if you, um, let's say you are hosting your own notary, what if you just have a interface which you need to implement, which you can um, use to expose your root keys? That means you only need to, to put on your web page, okay, where can others retrieve your root keys? Uh, meaning you can can automate it a bit further. So that means it's yeah. still distributed, um, which to some extent maybe adds a bit more security. Yeah, I think this would be a very lightweight service. Um, it definitely wouldn't be as heavyweight as the current notary uh, implementation is. I think here the goal would be, can we focus on uh, what the, uh, how we establish the auth to connect to that service and um, uh, what are sort of like some remediation steps if that service were compromised. I think those are the two things that go into consideration for that service. Yeah, so, so, what I was, uh, so what I was thinking about is if, if you, let's say you have your own notary server and um, you want to configure which routes are trusted, you can just configure one or many uh, URLs where routes can be retrieved from. Um, with some appropriate uh, authentication mechanism in between um, that at least uh, prevents people from having to uh, check if routes have been replaced or changed or things like that. So you basically yeah. just register yourself, okay, what are the URLs to fetch the keys from? Yeah, that's kind of in line with what I was thinking. Uh, Steve, did you want to, uh, did you have a comment there? Yeah, I mean, I was, so I'm coming at it from a usability perspective and asking the security experts here what the implications of it are, because um, we, we certainly want to make sure that people can find keys, you know, uh, and, and, a treat, and achieve, uh, uh, acquire them in a reasonable fashion. Is Since they're going to a particular registry to get the content, while we certainly want to have, you know, key management solutions that the user can choose or the the registry operator can choose that makes sense for that environment. It, is it considered unsafe to have a discovery or even an acquisition model that happens through the registry APIs, even though it's delegated to another underlying service? I, I'm trying to figure, I guess I'm trying to figure out how does the, where the keys are stored and secured. And of course, uploaded is a completely different thing than uh, retrieving them. Can that be integrated with the registry so we don't have the discovery problem? Because there's registries all over the place. They're just going to explode even more. We can't have just as many confusing places to go find keys and having a single key discovery service isn't realistic either. Um, I think part of what um, uh, I, I, I was kind of striving more for was decoupling the registry from that process um, in the sense that, you know, registries can tell you where to go uh, 
buying keys, they can also potentially redirect you um, to to other uh, locations as well, right? Um, so what guarantee do you have the URL you're going to is the URL you want it to go to, right? Um, so in that regards, I think that's kind of where I think like, and if you're going to say, I trust this publisher, um, you should know who that publisher is and why you're trusting them. Um, that was kind of like one of the actions I'm starting off with. But if I can get redirected, why couldn't I just be served from it? Again, for retrieval of keys. I'm, the upload of keys is, is a different, I'm not even beginning to touch on that one. Just for retrieval of keys. And maybe, um, uh, even, sorry, go ahead. Even for retrieval of keys, let's take this scenario, right? Like you have company A um, that has their key set up and you have company B that's taking in sort of like, you know, uh, uh, containers from company A and running them. Now, if they're going through a registry, right? And if the registry it decides to kind of like has, has, a, has a mechanism to kind of like point to a URL that has a key that's not used by company A, but says this is used by company A, uh, then company B can potentially, you know, use a key that doesn't belong to company A to verify container images, right? And so, the 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 way that company B is defining that we trust company A, um, they need something from company A to kind of say this is what we're going to tr use to trust your your images with, right? Like unless it comes from company A, I think if you're getting it from any other source, there's always a question of how do we know this comes from there. Um, one route to do this is using sort of like public CAs, which I think is something this model can extend into where if you have sort of like trusted entities, like if you have like a public CA that you trust and they're telling you this is something that belongs to company A, that's a mechanism we can explore. Um, but I think the bare functionality we need to kind of support here would be that I can go to company A and figure out what it is from them that I need to trust to their containers. Yeah, the, the, this is where like having those requirements listed, you know, kind of help scope some of this or help figure out how do we answer the question, I guess is a better way to say it. So if company B is, well, so what we consider, continually see is customers want to be able to lock down their registries to certain data endpoints and they can't be sent to other ones. We see this with the Windows foreign layers. We see this with um, uh, when registries had two different data URLs. The, but I guess the key and air gapped environments where I can't go to that vendor, but I guess the acquisition of the key in those kind of environments could be done out of band because the, the assumption it's locked down that type they probably don't want. I don't know, I guess I'm trying to figure out can, can the key from vendor A be put into the private registry so that that company can distribute those keys to ephemeral clients uh, so when they get booted up, is there something about that flow that kind of violates the security model? Because is it really that I can create another key that looks the same or I'm creating content, new content that looks like it's signed by uh, my, Microsoft, but it's actually signed by Microsoft or something? Like, can you really create a, a fake key or can you, you're creating co content that looks like the same content that points to the different key? Well, so keys don't have any information associated with them, right? Um, it's because I've gotten a key from like, let's say Microsoft.com that I know that this key belongs to Microsoft, right? Um, but by looking at a key directly, there's really nothing there that tells me, when I look at a root key specifically, um, there's really nothing there that tells me that this key belongs to Microsoft, for example. Uh, if we, and I think that's kind of where sort of like uh, using uh, a public CA becomes slightly different uh, because in the public CA scenario, the, the root key is essentially coming from a public CA. And so you trust, let's say, DigiCert, for example, uh, or Let's Encrypt. Uh, and then that's the public key you're trusting. And then you're relying on Let's Encrypt or DigiCert to verify that any intermediate or, or any other cert that they're issuing uh, is is actually being requested by Microsoft. Uh, but when we go down to sort of like establishing like which routes we trust, um, you only the only mechanism you have to validate that this route belongs to someone is by trusting the source you're getting it from. 
So I, I think from, from a usability perspective, if you look at the registry, uh, it would be very convenient if you can just enter a list of URLs that could be uh, uh, aws.com, uh, microsoft.com, where you are pointing to a bunch of uh, discovery services. Uh, it might even be that you have those discovery services where those keys are available, uh, that you have those uh, for given departments within a company. So, so when I look at um, uh, the way Philips is currently organized, um, there is a chance that uh, certain departments or certain uh, businesses want to manage their own. So from a usability perspective, it would be convenient if I can register that in the registry itself. What are my uh, trusted um, certificate um, discovery uh, URLs? Yeah. Um, that... um, then to, to, to keep this uh, separate from the registry also adds the advantage that um, yeah, people can deploy this um, in, in def different networks. So let's say if, if I'm publishing my keys in my, my own secured uh, network environment, uh, either within the company or, or across companies, um, I, I can keep basically the service which is able to retrieve them and provide them to, to the registry. I keep that, can keep that more close to each other. And, and then it's more or less like, like Niaz was mentioning, um, uh, you, you just redirect the traffic. Um, it's basically HTTP traffic, so you can just reverse proxy those kind of things. So from a flexibility point of view in, in a deployment, um, I think that also makes sense. I think I'd go, um, rather than having the registry expose it, this could potentially also be a part of the signature uh, where it tells you what the discovery URL is. Um, that way we're not necessarily relying on the registry kind of maintaining uh, a list and trusting the registry to maintain a proper list, right? Um, I think like one of the things I'd be concerned about is like and if a registry was maintaining the list, um, they could potentially like, you know, redirect from Microsoft to Microsoft, right? Like have a Microsoft URL and that's usually like, you know, something that could get easily missed. Uh, but if it's in the signature, then you've actually kind of, uh, you are proving that like, you know, you have control of this domain that you're pointing to uh, and that your key information is going to be there. Uh, and if this isn't a, a discovery URL you already trust, uh, you can actually validate who this URL belongs to and decide if you want to trust this or not. So I think maybe this is something we add in from a discoverability perspective into signatures. So. Uh, rather than trusting the registry, you trust the image uh, uh, to kind of tell you where to go look. I would actually be really concerned about having the discovery mechanism in the signature itself, because basically it's kind of at that point it's self um, validating itself because it's telling you where to go to verify itself. So I feel like we want some sort of um, kind of cryptographic mechanism around the discovery so that um, like you have to verify a separate signature before you can go to this discovery mechanism. Like there's, if there was some kind of route on the um, registry that could just point to these discovery mechanisms, then um, at least you do you know, one step of verification to make sure that those discovery URLs are correct as far as the registry knows. Yeah, I think the, uh, the discovery URL, like if it's present in signatures, I don't think it should be used to automatically trust the image. Uh, you're absolutely right. I think that like kind of leads to sort of like you automatically trust anything. I think there it would be some, we, we would want some manual intervention there where this is saying that like, you know, this registry isn't trusted. Um, here's the URL, go validate this before you put it into sort of like your trust config, right? Um, I think that's the that's the work that's that's the manual step we kind of expect there um, uh, for someone to go in. This potentially could go into something like an error message rather than kind of just saying like you know you can automatically uh, use the client to validate this based on whatever URL this is sharing with you. So I have to go soon, unfortunately, but I wanna I wanna raise a meta question and and encourage us to think about it. One is, it's not obvious to me, so uh, at least I'm not aware, fully aware of the context. It's not obvious to me. So what is the context here? Is it that we trust, or is there one registry or are there multiple registries, partly because there's private images, right? 
So is that the reason for decentralizing key discovery like this? Like why, why, why should there be? So, because my, my question is, if we trust the registry for artifacts, why not also trust it for distributing keys? Like to me, it's not obvious why. So some clarification would help. Um, I think part of it was that we, when we look at sort of like, you know, uh, today the model has kind of been that you're publishing to a single registry and you're signing for that single registry and that registry is maintaining that signature information for you. Uh, and so one of the goals of this was to make it easy to move containers from registry to registry and potentially allow anyone to set up a registry um, to host any images they want to. I think this leads to a concern around sort of like, you know, depending on who's setting up a registry, uh, if they're also responsible for sort of like maintaining some of the trust information, um, you know, if this, if, if anyone is setting up a registry, can we at that point trust registry owners to maintain uh, uh, this trust mechanism as well? So relying on a registry in that scenario, to me, it's kind of like breaks the trust model. Um, and I think that's part of been sort of like I've been looking at a very high level is can we decouple sort of like sharing of containers versus like trusting who actually wrote the container? I see. That's actually a very helpful context. I wasn't, I wasn't aware of this. So, so that's good to know. Thanks. I, I'm also going to have to drop off in a moment. So I wanted to raise a kind of, I think, related issue. So um, if you're going and you're having a system where you go and you have these URLs that you then go to and you rely on the CA system to provide you trust that the thing you're going to that URL is correct, then there's a natural question of why didn't you just put the public keys that you're trying to trust in instead of the URLs if you try to compare and contrast those designs? Because in, in one system, you get all of the kind of problems and overhead of the CA system to have this level of indirection that it isn't necessarily clear is, or it, at least I think it's it's worth worth thinking very carefully about what that buys for you, given all the the problems and difficulties with revocation, revocation not working the way that you would like it to or would expect it to, and all the trust problems with the CA system um, versus just directly putting key information in. Um, so I, I don't really understand yet, like, why, the, why this way of doing indirection is a, is a better way. I understand if you're just assuming that, um, like, you know, we don't want to look deep into those mechanisms. We're just going to try to use them as tools. I can see why this is something that would be thought of, but I don't know if, if you peel back the mechanism and think about it a little bit that you're getting anything better by putting URLs there than you would be by just putting the keys. Um, so I think the, what we're looking at is you can put both, right? You can put, you can both put keys and URLs. So it's what you can put one or the other. So if for, especially for air gapped environments, I think that's where like, you know, you'd want to put in keys rather than URLs and have an administrator do there. The URLs is really more of like saying that, hey, if I want to be able to automatically get like, you know, if when keys are being rotated or updated or uh, they're being revoked, like I want that information, a URL gives you some degree of automation in, in pulling that information in. Um, it's one where I think like, you know, if you without that, without that URL, then like, you know, that you're essentially relying on sort of like getting an update from company A. And knowing that, like, you know, their keys have been compromised and revoked and you need to kind of have, like, some kind of manual intervention. So the URL adds a, a, some degree of automation there where you can actually get notified that, hey, something has changed here. Um, but we definitely can't use the URL in all places, uh, especially in air gap regions. I think that's where, like, in using the key itself uh, would come in. Well, I think you can still use this uh, service with the URL in an air gapped uh, environment. So let's say if I run this service myself in my air gapped environment, uh, I can store the keys there manually, but uh, the systems connecting uh, to the service can still get the updates automatically. 
So from a, from a management perspective, I can manage those keys in one place instead of uh, different um, uh, locations in the system. So I, I think you can still use it as a proxy as well. Yeah, I think having both um, gives sort of like, you know, deployment administrators choices and how they want to do, uh, how they want to implement that. I don't think they're necessarily like mutually exclusive, right? Yeah, correct, correct. Yeah. But I, uh, I, I was trying to point out that it still could have value in an air-gapped environment. And I think that makes sense, yeah. So I, I also have another question. Um, so in this multi-registry world, um, I think the root keys have to be known by registries um, because um, when, when I derive from a image from uh, registry A and I push the new layer on my registry, uh, of course I might want to check some validity on the other layers. Uh, on the other hand, uh, also the, uh, the clients, um, the production systems, they also need to have access to these root keys. Um, is, is that a correct understanding from my side? Because that, that means you, you would need to manage those roots uh, on the registries as well on uh, clients consuming those images. Right. So I've added that in as a requirement for registries to have. Um, so uh, every time you're generating a new root key, one of the steps you're taking is uploading it to the registries where you're distributing containers to. Um, that ties it in uh, with sort of like your identity. Uh, and so uh, it is one where that you can continue uh, publishing images there. So for, for uploads there, you, you would need to do that. But that, that is something that the registry would, would, would validate um, uh, for subsequent uploads. Mm -hmm. so, so what about uh, consuming images? So let's say I'm consuming a Docker image and um, I configured my client uh, to trust uh, given root certificates, uh, which allows me to pull images from different registries. Um, um, what what would be um, would there be a difference to to configure such a client uh, as opposed to configuring a, a registry when it comes to to the root keys? I like to um, piece out a little bit. It's just where you where you get what registries you connect to, and what pull the content shouldn't really be tied to the the key of their certificate. In other words, I pull the Debian image that originally is built by the Debian Corp, let's just say, and it gets pushed up to Docker Hub, and then I move it into my registry, uh, and then I move into another registry in the air-gapped environment. It's gonna keep on moving, and in that case, maybe Debian's not the best image, but best example, say, Rabbit uh, MQ, where I'm not, I'm actually consuming it as is, as opposed to Debian where I build upon it. Um, so I wanna be able, to get that key from some place, but it shouldn't be tied to where the tied to the registry. I wouldn't be able to discover it through the registry. I guess was the idea, but they shouldn't be coupled. Hmm. They're not coupled. I think the 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 thing here is that um, are you also validating uh, images as they're being uploaded to the registries, right? Um, and what is that mechanism there? So. Um, let's say that, like you know, you're you're getting um, an image from uh, Wabbit Networks. Um, you've gotten the root key from Wabbit, and you know what the root key is, and you can verify any images. Uh, I think the question here is more that you know, if I am uploading to a registry, uh, let's say you know um, Wabbit, and I upload to a registry A or Docker Hub, uh, then Docker Hub can also potentially validate that this came from Wabbit and kind of like had managed sort of like a set of root keys. Um, and I think they're actually having the same verification mechanism that, um, uh, uh, that the client has just adds two layers of, of validation, right? It's more defense in depth. Um, it kind of ensures that registries themselves are validating. Uh, whether sort of like anything that's uploaded or sort of re-uploaded over that is came from a legitimate source uh, and, and meets the sort of like, you know, like there wasn't any tampering or any issues with that. Um, I think it's, it's 
it's one I, I'm tracking. I'm like we, I have steps for that drafted in requirements, but I think it's something we track as an optional requirement because uh, at the end of the day, you just still have validation at the client side to verify that even if you, if you know, something was compromised on the registry side, you're still protected. Um, I think this just kind of ensures that registries themselves are not storing compromised images potentially. Yeah, so the, the reason for my question is, uh, let's say uh, I have um, uh, a whole bunch of developers uh, who, who need to know what are the trusted routes. Um, how, how can I ensure that they, that they are not having uh, to, to configure a lot of URLs or keys which are trusted to to create the signatures because in, in general I would only need the key to create a signature and when consuming or running the image uh, I could basically rely on, on the signature themselves. So, so right. let's say if I have yeah. 10 developers and uh, Today we are trusting uh, um, three of these root keys. Um, tomorrow one has to be added. I have to tell all 10 developers, uh, you need to add this key to your uh, trusted chain as well. So from a usability right. perspective, I'm, I'm wondering if there is a way that we can keep that on the registry side, or if there, or if there is a need to to have this on on the yeah the the client side where where someone is interacting to to push that new image. I think there's two ways to address this in the current um, uh, proposal. One would be through that URL redirection. So if you have a URL that's pointing to sort of like your a uh, set of trusted keys, you can always just add more keys to it and then your developers are just always going to that single URL. Um, the other mechanism uh, would be that in, uh, in if we have a key sharing service, um, you can potentially um, uh, configure sort of like what keys you're putting in that key sharing service and using that as a proxy as well. So I think that's kind of where I envisioned uh, uh, Notary v2 kind of like the, the notary server kind of like being revised to is being sort of like more like a repository of trusted root keys uh and and that's that's why i think something that we can look into sort of like the additional component um but at least for now like the url i think would at least give you that uh uh, uh that information yeah i have on a kind of a similar note i think that key revocation is also a time when you need to kind of like immediately update the keys that you trust um, I just kind of wonder how that could be handled or like, and also similarly a compromise of, um, you know, whatever URLs or servers that are hosting these public keys. So how, how are those all protected kind of? Yeah, I think this is one where we'll, we'll need to do sort of like a detailed threat model next in terms of what are the potential ways these could be compromised. And we'll need to kind of break this down into like, what are things we're addressing in the design to address that? Um, but the uh, the thing here would be that um, you know if uh, if the if the URL itself is compromised, um, then you know uh, it, it does it it does lead to the fact that like you know if uh, uh, someone else puts in newer URLs or something, then you would be that is something that you know you'd be you'd have to kind of like protect against. Um, and I think this is one where. Um, uh, we want to think through sort of like in each one of these breaches, like what actions would people be taking? Um, like a URL breach is potentially something that, uh, you know, would be recognized as like, this is a major hack and, you know, there might be information and things and we, we need to kind of go work, work through that model. Okay, that makes sense. Maybe that's the next step is to walk through um, the situations for key revocation and various compromises and see how those work. Yep. So what I'll do is, um, I don't think we've quite settled uh, on a decision in um, how we're going to have the, uh, the key sharing service work, but I think we've talked through a little bit more detail here. Um, I'm going to take uh, try and take a stab at uh, updating the doc over the weekend, um, uh, and I'll, I'll try and highlight sort of like a, a short doc on what sort of like some of the considerations here are, uh, so we can potentially review that in the Monday meeting. 
All right, sounds good, thank you. Uh, Steve, if we have like a like a, a short like paragraph that summarizes sort of like what some of the concerns like you know we've had different people bring up in this group, um, I think that's something we can read through quickly and discuss in the uh, in the Monday meeting, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, okay. yeah, it'd be great to kind of summarize what the thoughts are. So, for instance, what we're uh, we're actually recording the KubeCon talk today for. Notary V2 status, and it was supposed to be a working session, so we're going to joke about that because now it's a recording. And we're basically just going to say, here's the things we're at, and here is the open questions. And um, I think it kind of helps people understand what, what people feel fairly confident on and moving forward, mm -hmm. and they can agree or disagree, and then they feel confident that, yeah, they haven't figured this one out, and I'm glad they haven't figured it out because I don't like the answer I'm seeing. You know, so it kind of helps categorize right. both, and they know where to engage. And I think the key discovery, and maybe there's, you know, there's the whole key life cycle management that you're, you know, driving as part of this. I think there's a subsection of what exactly does key discovery and acquisition mean, not just key management, um, when you take in consideration that multiple registries as content moves between registries and content moves into error gapped environments. What is the right model? And I, I don't know if you've been following this conference. Well, I think you have, yeah, because we've had that uh, that smaller group conversation of what types of keys should we support? And what I kind of heard from this one is, is maybe the like GPG, and again, I'm, I'm not an expert, so I'm just I'm echoing what I think I'm hearing, are easy for free and you know, the community can use them and maybe they don't give that you know, high trust because there's no domain or CA associated with it. And then if larger software vendors want to use a CA base, then they can. And, that gives them more confidence, but they have to, you know, the model is they have to pay for it because there's another service that gets validated. Yeah, one of, the, one of the issues with uh, GPG uh, trust model is that you'd have to have uh, keys uh, go back and forth and you do end up trusting the registry at that point. Uh, and so uh, uh, that one has some other repercussions we'll want to think through. Uh, uh, and so uh, GPG potentially is a solution, um, but there you do need to trust the registry itself uh, to a certain extent. Uh, and uh, if the X509 or the CA model is another one we can look at where uh, I think the concern comes in around sort of like, you know, if we have to go get like publicly trusted certificates, then there is a cost to that. I think the way, the ad hoc way we're thinking about it right now um, gives you an option to use X509 and use public CAs and also use sort of like private routes, like you could do one or the other. Um, mm -hmm. So I like that model because you can support both both formats and you don't necessarily need to trust the registry. Uh, but I'll, I'll elaborate a little bit more on that on the GPG side and you know we can have a, a, another discussion on that as well. I think the GPG versus 509 versus the ad hoc, uh, that will probably be, take me like a week to write up. So maybe <laughs> we can discuss it in the Monday after. Uh, the uh, shorter one, I think we can have uh, next Monday in terms of like the decision process we're going through here right now. What I might suggest is um, because, you know, with each one of these PRs, the, the, the uh, comments endlessly go on and it churns and churns and you can never get a, a merge is maybe do a separate one on key options, like a separate markdown and a separate PR uh, for uh, pros and cons of keys of what we might support. And then we could have yeah. that discussion on that document. And maybe there's a separate document for uh, the key acquisition model. And you know, maybe once off, let's assuming at some point, we can actually get agreement on these three things, right? Your scenarios that you have here, the types of keys we would use is a separate one, separate PR, then the third one is the acquisition. And once all three are done, everybody's comfortable with them, then we just merge them into the spec. Because remember, this whole thing is a, is a, a sketching and iteration model. This is not intended to be the final spec. So it, it kind of helps people get to it, the, com uh, the confidence place. Yeah, I agree. I think I can separate that out into a separate pull request. So um, I'll, I'll definitely keep that in mind. Cool. All right, so um, yeah, if you want to put something on Monday's schedule, just that you're going to take, uh, and we're back to 10 a.m., our, our time, Pacific time. Um, 
I just put something on the agenda that says, hey, I'll do a quick recap of these topics or whatever it is you want to talk about. Sounds good. I'll go ahead and do that. All right. Um, I think that's um, all we had to discuss today. I think the key revocation scenario, you'll probably want to wait till next week to dive in until we've settled on uh, the key sharing components and, and potentially that gets addressed in the threat model as well. Um, so I, I don't think we, uh, we, we want to jump into that today. And I think having Trishank and Justin for that conversation would also make sense. Um, okay, uh, Marco, thank you for taking notes. Uh, it's definitely very helpful. Um, I totally was going to have to spend another 15, 20 minutes writing them up. So thank you for doing that. Yeah, I'm not sure if they are fully complete, but uh, at least it's a start. All right, sounds good. Um, thanks, everyone. Have a good weekend, and uh, hope we'll see you guys on Monday. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Thanks. Bye.